I'm Xiao Ma. You are listening to Alien Series Serializing. Welcome to Alien Theorists Theorizing, Theorists in the Desert, number five. I'm Zell. I'm Dan. And we have cut the other two members for today. Instead, we're going to replace them both with our newest guest, Xiao Ma. How's it going? Are you there? Look frozen. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Xiao, can you hear us? Hello? Yeah, it's a little bit of... Um... Yeah, the connection issue. Yeah, no problem. We'll uh, we'll deal with it on the fly. Yeah, we're working with three different time zones. Yeah, here, so. we, we got time zones. We got Skype. Cut some slack. <laughs> Anyways, Xiao Ma is a Chinese ufologist and a researcher in conscious studies. She has extensive contact experiences with non-human intelligence through various paranormal contact modalities. So thank you very much, Xiao, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Ben. Oh, it's a pleasure. So just to get started, what got you started into ufology? Was there a central event or how did you go down this field of study? You know, I used to be just the average Joe Blow working in Sydney from Monday to Friday. Um, my uh, turning point happened back in 2012 when I was traveled to um, the law firm's, you know, um, Brisbane office. And then what I actually saw is a UFO craft hovering in the sky just outside of my office window. That moment really triggered me a bit. And I start to think maybe there's something, you know, um, beyond what I know. So I start to look into these paranormal activities, try to figure out what's going on in my life. It's basically that would be my uh, turning point in my life to sort of introduce me into these um, rabbit hole theory, you know, Alice in the Wonderland, start to dig the hole. And after that incident happened in 2012, I start to have other uh, special, you know, not special, like experiences, like out-of-body experiences, um, encounter with ET beings in the dream state, lucid dreaming, and all other, you know, like a, a medium channeling or all other interesting um, experiences. So I would say that 2012 incident really triggered everything um, moving forward. So that's how actually I got into this field. So actually from a sighting of a craft is how you started. You are correct. Yeah, a sighting of a craft in Brisbane. And funny enough, Brisbane is actually a hot spot of, you know, um, UFO sightings. A lot of people um, being triggered by UFO sighting in Brisbane including me. Oh, cool. Yeah. That, I mean, you hear about UFO hotspots around the world, so it's good. Yeah, yeah so exactly. That, I guess that would be Australia's. Yes. Now, I mean, we hear a lot, pretty much all the cases we talk about on this show and many other shows are from North America or Europe. So we'd like to get some, I mean, you're born in China. You've, from what I re read, you moved to Australia for school and university and you kind of reside between the two is that correct yes yes that's correct yes so let's uh give us a crash course into ufology coming out of china because we, we don't hear a lot yeah well china is actually a quite different ufology field compared with a western country so after my experience uh you know having in brisbane um i went through what's that called the dark night of the soul you know try to figure out what's going on so I had to hit my low in my life and then bounce back. So, and then one day someone just said, hey, Xiao, look, I know that you had quite a few interesting experiences. Why don't you come to the show and share some of your story in China? So, and then I got on uh, a Chinese platform, you know, similar to YouTubers and like your platform. And uh, I talk about my life experience and this and that. Interestingly, the first interview just went viral. Like people just, oh my God, this happened to me. This happened to me. So I put out my uh, my email address. So anybody have similar experience, please contact me. So within like two or three days, I got hundreds of email, and my uh, my email address almost got crushed by how many <laughs> you know the emails I got. 
What's interesting is what I actually learned from Chinese ufology is that there are many, many people, which is pretty common in China, that people having this kind of experience, like, you know, people like, you know, our brothers and sisters in States, in Australia and other countries. So it's a global phenomenon. But what happened in China is so different is that due to the political control, there's very little information available in China. So when, you know, if me or other people do a quick show, they're just like, oh, that's something new. So they are very hunger for more information. They try to link or relate my experience with their experience, see what they can gain from it. So China ufology is interesting because you got a lot of people who are awakened or semi-awakened. They are in the state, early stage of figure out what's going on. But there's very little information due to political control. Right. So uh, that's quite different in China. And again, Chinese ufology, from my perspective, could be 30 to 40 years behind the Western ufology due to information control. Right. So, I mean, because you hear about it, but we don't really know a lot about it. That I mean, it's like a, clo a closed internet or, or not, not completely closed because you can use VPNs and stuff. But for the most part, it's controlled, right? Yeah, it is very controlled. You're right, um, Ryan. Like uh, you know, in China, we got it's called the firewall. You know, we you heard about China got a great wall, <laughs> but people doesn't know that China have a firewall. Firewall means we can't use Google, we don't have Facebook, we don't have access to WhatsApp. Uh, I think Skype as well. So any major websites that you heard about, which is not accessible in China, unless you download what's called a VPN, right. so you can jump the firewall to use it. So that means, that shows you, it's, it's a very much information control. So people have a little bit of information about it. So people are like, what's going on? So many things happened to me, you know, but I want to know what's going on. So they are very hungry for information. So what the Chinese do is they get on the YouTube through VPN, and then they just check all those popular YouTubers, like your channel and other people's channel. They use it, they put in the, like a Chinese subtitle in the news, and they just, 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 just like move it to China. So people can learn from all those Western information. So what I want to share is that there's a lot of Western information in China. You know, they can move the information, jump the firewall, but there are very little information originated from China due to political control. Yeah. Right. So now the... Um I just, I'm always kind of curious about like, so China, like over 40% of it is like rural population, things like that. But like 70% of the population has access to internet. Where, where are, uh, in your experience or to your knowledge, like what are, what are the hotspots since Brisbane is one dude, are there certain UFO hotspots in China as well? Where a lot of re or like UFO reports center around? Yeah, Dan, you are correct. There are quite a few hotspots in China. For example, you know, the Western um, how you call it, the southwest part of China, which is sort of between Xinjiang and Yunnan province. So that sort of area is a hot spot. One of the reasons which I heard, which yet to be confirmed, is that there's less population density. And what I heard is there's so many bases on the ground. I don't know whether it's belong to alien or military or not. It's up to people to come. And so uh, because it's less population, so they can do more, which they probably doesn't want people to know. So that's that's a, one of the hot spots. So the village people, the rural Chinese based in these areas, they always say, oh, we see you on a daily basis. They just hear, you know, those are the like the local farmers. And the other very famous hot spot is sort of near the uh, north part of China. I think it's 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 called the Changbai Mountain sort of towards like Heilongjiang's very north part of China. Um, that mountain is very famous for, you know, paranormal activities, like a lot of sighting for Bigfoot, Bigfoot sightings, mm. and all sorts of different, according to them, creatures. Um, I suspect that could be different beings, interdimensional being or some other beings or aliens, I don't know. Um, in those areas, but again, even the, the uh, even those big cities like Beijing or Shanghai, constantly people capture those UFO sightings, short clip or videos. You know, they release on those TikTok. Um, so, oh, what is this? Look at this. So, there are quite a few hotspots in China. Yes. 
Wow, that's cool. Now, it, like there's hot spots, and I know like in North America, the central figure in ufology is Roswell. Is there like a central event in Chinese ufology that everyone kind of turns to? Yeah, there's a, um, there are quite a few famous cases in China. I would say when it's from the civilian point of view, it's called the Phoenix Mountain case. The Phoenix Mountain case, without going into too much detail, just brief information, is to talk about the Chinese farmer. So he went with his friend, got into the Phoenix Mountain, then they saw a sort of like egg-shaped sort of like a, a, a spaceship landed on top of a, like a rock in that mountain. So they got really close and all of a sudden they got that, you know, black screen, just they just all, all like all of a sudden unconscious. Mm. And what happened later is that he claimed that he had physical intimacy with a, a, a female alien beings. And then he claimed that the, be, uh, those beings told him that they have a hyper child due to that intimacy, uh, you know, uh, physical contact. So that case just went viral in China. I think that case in China happened quite a few years ago. But mind you, that was during, a, relatively speaking, a, a more or less open period for those information to flow. But nowadays, China is even more stringent in terms of information control. So during that time, people can talk about, you know, UFO sightings or or kind of contact with ET. So that case became really famous in China back then because firstly, it involves with um, UFO landing. The secondly, that Chinese farmer claimed to have physical contact with the ET being. The third point is that he claimed that he had a hyper child. So that case became viral in China. Um, yeah, I mean, I still have his contact detail. If you want, you can interview him you know, for your next show. Oh, well, so. yeah, we might have to get that from you. So he actually, through his encounter, they procreated like a hybrid being. That's what he says. Yes, yes. And he said the being told him 20 years later, they will have, um, they have a hyper child whose father is a Chinese farmer. So that case just, you know, went viral in China. And then, of course, the local authorities step in and say, oh, this is just nonsense. It's not real. Don't pay attention. It's not real. So standard stuff, this information and the try to suppress information come to the public. Cool. We'll have to put that one on our list to look up because I haven't heard of that one. Yeah. Awesome. So I want to ask because this is, I know, I, I've, I've never been sure if it's internet lore or what it is, but do you know anything about the, like ch pyramids in China that have been, you know, barricaded off and not let, like no one's been able to research yeah. them? What can you tell us about that? Thank you so much for asking that. I mean, literally every interview, people ask me the same thing. China, I'm not sure if the viewer notice or not. China has lots of pyramids, but nobody really talks about that. I mean, not as I know of. It's like... Uh, it's, it's a talk within the little communities, you know, right. in our communities, but not for the broader extent. China actually have a lot of pyramids. Um, I wish I can prepare some photo I can show you guys, but which I haven't really got a chance. So many pyramids, and those pyramids are unexplored, unexcavated pyramids. So as you can see, the pyramids... Uh, is a global phenomenon. You can see that from Sumerians, Mayans, Egyptians, and so does happen in China. And those pyramids, actually, a lot of them existed more than you know our civilization, even China created, you know, established. So this is a global phenomenon. Right, that's cool. And sorry, if you don't mind, I'm adding no, to one going. more point. There are some smart Chinese. And they say like, oh my God, there's so many pyramids. Even my friends, you know, on the show, they say, maybe we can just go there, do some digging, you know, maybe we can find something interesting. So what really stopped people to explore those pyramids is that it is extremely difficult to get government permit. So you need to get those like a, a license or permit in order to do the excavation, right? So, but those permits are only, normally speaking, 99% chance would be granted 
to like governmental bodies, you know, you belong to whatever academy or uni, and those uni are basically all very much controlled by the CCP. So any like civilian level, like you and I, or let's let's just for personal hobby, let's do something interesting or scientific research. Normally speaking, they will reject it. So it's very hard to get those permit. For any illegal digging or excavation, very likely to face more than 10 years full sentence in jail. So that's the key reason of why preventing people to do any further diggings. Uh, trust me, there's a lot of smart <laughs> Chinese to try to work a way out of it. Like maybe we can do something, you know. Some with a, a good intention, they just want to see what's underneath. And some people just looking for gold and other interesting stuff. So far, they have no luck to dig further. But I bet, Ryan, that the government might know some truths underneath, which they don't share with us. Um, I'll be surprised that they haven't done anything in the last few years. I reckon they probably did some excavation. Um, they haven't really shared information with us. Um, at least that's my perspective. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. They have pyramids. I mean, there's pyramids not far away. I mean, and Cambodia is full of its own style of pyramids, so it only makes sense that, you know, you would think that they would just continue on through. Uh, is is there any, like, is there a pyramid there that is known? Like, is there public knowledge of, like, a like a big pyramid or something that, or is it still, it's all hush-hush, there's no, like, public knowledge, really? Uh, a lot of them are public knowledge, and it's always on the newspaper. For example, there's a two very famous one, uh, I mean, uh, in the Xi'an, province that's where all the ancient empires sort of like located so those regions have a lot of pyramids could be some like uh, um, uh, you know ancient place where they had treasure I don't know so those are the famous pyramids you always see from the newspapers people talk about it um, yeah so it's, it's near the Xi'an sort of region so when we talk about Xi'an province that's where um the ancient civilizations are normally based in the heart of China, so like in the mid towards west part of China. Right. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, I mean, there's probably plenty of legitimate reasons why they don't want people digging there, but it is strange that they wouldn't let any, you know, I mean, that's well, just the political climate itself, that they won't let anybody come it's, in for like a legitimate right. digging or, you know, or like a, I'm sure they wouldn't let any foreign archaeologists or that you'd have very little chance of getting in there. But uh, just the fact that they won't let internally want to know what's down there. They could be barrel mounds. Yeah, like you said, they could just be, um, you know, ancient. There's, there's plenty of lost tombs, I'm sure, uh, just hanging around in China. Yeah, but, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, then I wish that the civilians like us, you know, we can form a scientific research group, whatever, you know, have a, quite a few people apply for a permit and go there, do some proper digging, you know, try to figure out what's going on there. But uh, it's just due to the po uh, political climate, it's very unlikely could be the case. Um, especially in the last few years, I'm not sure if the viewer noticed of that or not. China has more tight on the country in terms of you know um, freedom of speech and other stuff so the the whole political climate is not super friendly at this stage for this kind of like you know exploration so we have to wait maybe for the coming years things will get better let's hope right yeah, <laughs> yeah. let's hope 100 percent. i mean that's a it's a big big country with a lot of history so it's probably a lot of really interesting archaeological yeah, finds but again, like those ancient Yes, those ancient civilizations, those pyramids are not just belong to any nations. It's it's a it's humanity's treasure, right? We all want to know what's going on. And it existed beyond the time when China fully established as a nation, so to speak. So this is really it belongs to humanity. So we want to know, we want to get information now, like what's going on there. So uh, I hope one day the political climate can change so we can get more information from it. Yeah, definitely. Now, I wanted to ask you, because I know at Contact in the Desert, you will going to be presenting on something quite interesting. So I was wondering if you could give us a quick little sneak peek on, I don't want to say the name because I think I'm going to butcher it. So if you could take us back a 3,000 year old uh, ancient civilization that's recently been discovered. Yeah, this is called, I know it's a, a, a 
the Chinese name is pretty hard to pronounce. It's called the San Xing Dui. It's quite tricky. So how it's been translated is called the Three Star Piles or Three Star Mount. The name was given by Chinese. It's actually quite connected with the star system. How they actually found is there's a three piles of soil and each pile is all pointing towards the Orion constellation. It's like a great pyramid of Giza, you know, you've got three pyramids all pointing towards the Orion build. So how that's how they named it. What they actually found is those three piles are pointing towards the Orion build. So you can see there is a kind of like ancestor or some kind of religious connection, you know, during that time, they call high priests connecting with a star and that star happened to be Orion constellation. Um, I do believe there's a more or less a connection towards that. And also during my presentation, why this archaeology founding is so important is not just because it's connection with the star like Orion constellation, but also what they have found is this civilization due to their closings, cultures, wearing, you know, the habit of using gold and all those like a bronze heads, they resemble a more Caucasian look, high nose bridge, big eyes, you know, the whole facial shape. And according to those artifacts, they're very strong evidence. I will use the word of beyond reasonable doubt to say that this is a lost civilization originated from the Mesopotamian uh -huh. sort of civilization. Um, so we're talking about the connection with Sumerians and ancient Egyptian cultures. So why is it so important to say, oh, so what? You know, some people say, all right, we know there's a, you know, Caucasian race arriving in China back in 3,000 to 5,000 years ago. But my argument and even some archaeologists will say, of course, it's important because it shakes people's paradigm. Uh, when people say, you know, Chinese or ancient Chinese, is that always mean, you know, Chinese look like me, like ancient Mongolian looking, you know, the, the Asian black hair and the eyes like that? No. I mean, ancient Chinese, according to these foundings, can point to the fact that two tribes, one is Asian looking, the other Asian Chinese can refer to a more Caucasian looking beings. So people need to redefine the meaning of Chinese. So that's lost civilization is very likely to be a Caucasian looking race originated from Sumerian and ancient Egyptians. Um, so yeah, I'll talk about that in my uh, presentation. Cool. So like, you know, people always talk about maybe an ancient global spanning civilization. And that's kind of why you see similar building styles pop up around the world, seem seemingly around the same time. So what you're saying is this could be a continuation of that theory, like these people could have come from this area. On the West, you know, they can, they are the an ancient um, Egyptians or ancient Sumerians arriving in China and they are form a part of the ancient Chinese race. So the theory of how you define the meaning of China or Chinese, or like not the China part, it's political, but I mean, how you define the meaning of ancient Chinese really have to think twice now. It's not always like Asian looking, but could be the ancient Chinese can also contain the race of more Caucasian look. So we need to be a little bit more open minded. You know, the people talk about, uh, you know, Chinese always have to be like that. Japanese always have to be looked like that. But not the case. I think it challenged the theory of origin of human species, how it's been originated and where it came from. Another funny thing about this is to do with culture and belief. What we have found in this law civilization is that they have the tendency of worshipping eyes. You know, Chinese always talk about dragons, you know, they worship the dragons, dragons, but this civilization worshipping eyes. There's so many artifacts or relics um, have the look of eyes, just eyes, you know, focus right. on eyes. Why it's so important is it's related to Sumerian. And even when we talk about Illuminati's, you know, Illuminati have that symbol even on your dollar note, you know, that pyramid with the eye on top. This is what they actually found very similar in this civilization. They, what they're talking about is they are king, have an eye on top. It resembles like, you know, they talk about the third eye, opening of the third eye. And the minister or servant to the but I, you know, they fall down, the eyes are dropped. 
the slave, they believe, don't deserve to have eyes. So they always blind the slave, you know, so they don't deserve to have eyes. So as you can see, that's a pyramid sign. The king on top have eye on top. The middle man, in the eyes in the middle. And the, the bottom part, the mass, doesn't deserve to have eyes. So what does that show you? It's a pyramid, more like an Illuminati symbol. So my theory is that this kind of eye worshipping culture existed maybe longer than we know. We're talking about 5,000 years ago, the civilization. So uh, um, it seems like regardless when we're talking about Illuminati or Sumerians or whatever, there's a commonality, a connection towards that eye idol belief, you know, eye worshipping eyes culture. So uh, I do believe more or less the ancient civilization all tied back to one or two major civilizations. Cool. Yeah. Either way you look at it, evidence of a, you know, a earlier than, than believed contact with, you know, proto or um, Indo-European cultures and, and the East, like and well, the cultures in China would be a, a huge find that would definitely change a lot of, uh, or at least inject some new theories into to what is now currently accepted uh, history or seen as, you know, historical fact, but seeing that perhaps if, if they had, I mean, from what we know about, I'm sure what we know a lot about like uh, Chinese, you know, astrological ast astronomy, uh, ancient astronomy and things like this, they were accomplished in their own right. This is perhaps, you know, perhaps they gained some of this knowledge from contact with other cultures in the West. It could, you know, possibly yeah. something like that, but even, yeah. you know, having that kind of knowledge, uh, and saying that it came from somewhere else, yeah, it could change the whole, you know, even China's political, you know, belief system would be shaken. I, I'm sure its whole national, its pride as a nation, or you know, it, its pride in, in its history and its culture, and I mean, the whole, you know, CCCP, like that would rock them too. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Definitely I, down to the I, foundations, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, Dan, you're right. I think it's time for us to drop that pride, you know, like say, look, there's certain connections between those civilizations. What have we got? Let's compare and learn from each other. I think we need to drop that as a nation wise, whatever, need to drop that pride and ego say, oh, that's what we found. What's that evidence of point towards? You know, we have to learn from the facts rather than, you know, like, so uh, I agree with you. So the culture speaking, we need to be more humble and learn from each other. But again, uh, from this sort of presentation, what I actually found is that there's a lot of similarities between Western culture and Eastern culture. It's not so much different, like vastly different compared with each other. There's a many similarities or commonalities between those uh, two, two worlds, I would say, especially now everything is interconnected. So yeah, I agree. Oh, that's really cool. I'm I'm excited to tune in for that one, the contact in the yeah, desert. Thanks. Now, and we we got you for a little while longer, so I want to pry in a little bit to because, I mean, you've seen you you've seen a UFO, and that's what got you started. So what what are your like what are your beliefs into the ET phenomenon? What do you think? What do you think it is? Is this like something that originates on Earth? Is this like I mean, there's interdimensional theories, there's time travel theories. Do you have something that you kind of lean on? This is a big question. I mean, um, I think it's a mixture of everything. I think so. I think it can be the military, can be aliens, could be interdimensional being, extra dimensional being. It's a mixture of everything. That's what I can see from this UFO phenomenon. And there are some theories say that those aliens are our future self. And I believe Part of it is true, you know, there are certain race I heard they're the future human beings travel back time, you know, back in time to see us. So I believe so. And they are also being, you know, which I encounter are very benevolent. Most of them are very benevolent, try to help us. Some are, are quite neutral, you know, business like. I'm just here, you know, check you out, see what you human beings are like, you know. And they're a very small group, uh, quite malevolent, not very friendly. So I think this is a mixture of everything. Um, exopolitics is a very interesting topic to explore. Um, but I do believe what I've been told, since you mentioned about the uh, you know, alien theory, uh, what I've been told is we have very glorious future. We do. And uh, But again, it's only for certain populations. That's what I've been told. For the human being who can, for the bad, uh, you know, for the lack of a better word, 
whether you call it ascension or you know great awakening you know everybody label it differently that it's this the entire ending is going to be the final sort of let's call it divorce between the higher vibrational people and lower vibrational people so what, what i've been told is earth is great glorious in the future but it's only for certain po um, percentage of population who can actually transform into the next stage whereas there's a lower vibrational people will face other consequences so we just want to make sure that we can finish our game in the end life transformation right so the so this yeah so uh this future that's described is more like a um like a it's a sort sort of a, a spiritual awakening or, or something like that is it um is it more like we, we will be able to, are, are we going to ascend in the sense that we'll be able to join some type of, uh, like you said, exopolitics, will we join some type of, uh, you know, intergalactic uh, a coalition of some type or like, are we working towards that? Is this, this what you, uh, what you've been led to believe is that we're going to join with them and be a, like a vital part of it? I think so. I think Dan, um, uh Moving forward, I think everybody have to play a role in this grand sort of scheme thing. So I believe so. That's what I've been told. You know, like a lot of beings, they don't think like linear, like past, present, and future. But what I've been told, interestingly, around early April this year, is one of the messages is the first contact is already happened. You see, the use of what already happened, but I'm just like, but it's not happened yet. So from their perspective, they say, see everything past, present, and the future is one. Oh, that's already happened. But for us, maybe we have to go through this timeline, linear timeline to see, oh, that's already happened. So what I'm saying is maybe that's already been planned in our future. We just have to sort of like flip the page uh, to the next page to see what's actually happened. So already the book already or like a the book is being written. We just have to flip the page every now and then to reach to the last chapter. So I do think uh, we will join this intergalactic sort of federation, whatever you want to call, and every of us will play an important role in this grand plan. Right. So people who, I mean, I'm sure like, you know, people, like, as you say, like transcend to a, like a higher vibrational being, it's not something that will happen like overnight, all of a sudden, half the people on Earth will be at this new level, and half will be left behind. It'll be like a slow, a slow build, and like a transformation of like the human consciousness away from like war and greed and that kind of stuff, and more into like a utopia type of thing. I have slightly different view um, in terms of that theory. I do believe it's going to be a quantum jump. So I mean, could be one major event trigger the entire shift so that one major event i don't know some people are very popular talking about a solar flare i don't know exactly how the whole thing will be played out but judging by the vision i've been showing is and then they will be landed in this new earth it's just you know the pictures i don't know how it's going to be played out exactly but i do believe it's not just going to be purely spiritual you talk about a you know conscious expansion on the physical level we will see some major um, unprecedented change in, on this planet i do believe so and from what i can feel because uh, I really want to know the date, even though I know there's no precise date. I want to know which year. I want to know which year. Hmm. Uh, I haven't got a date. I really want to know, but I've got a very strong sense it's going to happen in the next three to four years time frame. I've got a very strong feeling about that. I think 2023 will be a very interesting year to um, to look, yeah, to pay attention to. So you're talking, so like a solar flare, obviously, like a big solar flare would be a, you know, cataclysmic uh, event. So is that kind of what you're thinking? Like a, an, an event will be so catastrophic that humanity will ha like be forced to change overnight? I don't, um, I won't call it as a negative event, but I think there are quite a few major events can happen simultaneously at the same time. Right. Say, like in, like in the religious sense, they 
they have a term called rapture. You know, certain people will be half a cell. And, 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 you know, you can see the solar event or could be a great awakening. That means all of a sudden you may have a Kundalini awakening where all the information just being released to you. Then you have a quantum jump. That means you all of a sudden you can be transformed into, an, you know, the next higher level species, a human being or a, a big upgrade. So I call that as a quantum jump, you know, for the spiritual sense. So I think, and, and all, like all of a sudden, you know, the global worldwide, we will have a major awakening. Like, ah, oh, you know, all of a sudden we're leaving this, you know, matrix. That's what I actually realized after that, you know, Kundalini awakening, whatever you want to call it. So I do believe quite a few things like a full disclosure solar event grand kundalini awakening you know the, the drop down the matrix may happen simultaneously at the same time so i don't see that as necessarily negative or positive it just the whole thing will play out in a short you know such a short time even i would say less than one hour or even then 30 minutes um, that would be very interesting to see. So that's just my perspective. I don't claim to be absolute right. So, yeah. Right. It's like a, a chain reaction. A quick chain yeah. reaction would change humanity, either for the better yeah. or worse, but we're not really sure. It's like, um, I have to believe in some level, we already been given the full disclosure. But what happened is because we need to operate, you know, Monday to Friday, we have to go to work. So better not to let us know how thing, what's going on at nighttime, you know, what happened in the spaceship when you, you know, on the spaceship. So what they do is they kind of like black out certain information for you so that you can operate during daytime. So when the grand Kundalini awakening happened, everything just going to be released to you. You know, you, you may heard about people talk about near death experience. Mm -hmm. just, just within a few seconds, they have those like, memories kickbacks you know like a play like a um like a like a ppt slides you just keep going so i believe that would happen so all of a sudden you have full full body awakening spiritual awakening and also you have full disclosure you you kind of know what's going on behind the scenes you know the major governments what have they done to us and this and that so and then the soul of lead kicks in everything kicks in so i think all the major events may happen at the same time. Uh, just, just, just my, my observation, my perception. So yeah. No, that's awesome. Uh, we're pretty much at the time here uh, to let you go. But if people want to find more about your work, where can they look you up online? Do you have a website or Facebook, Twitter? Um, I have an email address. I'm normally happy to contact with people by email. They can email me at you know Xiao S H A O dot ma at hotmail.com so it's shao dot ma at hotmail.com and uh yeah more than happy to you know patch up a, a different interview for you and then you know with different chinese ufologists or spiritual leaders in china not just china you know maybe a japan and other place and I do believe that next hype in our community will be hearing more information from Asia, you know, Asia continent, what's happening in those countries. So I do welcome people to email me. I'm more than happy to make those introductions. No, that's awesome. Yeah, we definitely, Maybe. definitely would like to hear more about, I mean, we don't hear a lot about China. I mean, Japan, I, I, it's, it's, yeah, it's, the other, uh, it's the other yeah. side of the world. So it'd be awesome yeah, to hear more I'd about love it. to hear some Eastern thought yeah. on, you know, Eastern thought opinions, like uh, having to do with either, like, you know, more Zen, Taoist, Buddhist, like, thoughts on things yeah. that are going on sometimes. It's interesting to, to kind of pick pick at those those uh, those brains. It would be nice. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What I actually also learned is that, you know, Asians, because we in different countries have different ideology and different personality traits. And due to those personality traits, how they respond to those contacts could be very different compared with like a Western brother and sisters. You know, people may have experience like, oh, my God, this happened to me. Ryan, right, then let's jump on the YouTube. Let's do a show. Talk about it. Yeah. So that's very the way that like, very outspoken and the people viewers can, can can jump on the YouTube and watch and they can listen and learn from it with Asian behave very differently. So I think it would be in, um, very interesting for people to learn how the Asians cope with their contact experiences. How do they respond to 
period. And what's happening in those Asian countries, it's, it will be very interesting, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh, if you want to tune in to Xiao's uh, presentation at Contact in the Desert, it's Friday, June 25th at 9 a.m. That is Pacific time. Awesome. Thank you very Great. much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Dan. All right. Keep those eyes on the skies. Keep up to date with all things alien theorists theorizing. Follow us across social media on Twitter, Instagram, Patreon, and Facebook. For updates on new videos and content on YouTube, don't forget to click like and subscribe and hit that notifications button to keep those eyes on the skies with alien theorists theorizing.